We are in a series called, Are We There Yet? Which is the uh, number one question that gets asked by children in the back of the car any time of the year, including the holiday season. And so last week we talked about what do you do when you don't want to go there? There are demands imposed on us we prefer to avoid. We're still obligated to show up, so what does that look like? And today what I'd like to talk about is uh, what happens when you don't know how to get there. If you don't know how to get there, what are we supposed to do? So we're in Matthew, the second chapter. We're looking at the story of Christmas because it's more than just an historical event. It's filled full of principles that help us understand how to navigate life. And it says in Matthew, the second chapter, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was, what's the next word? And that explains the rest of the sentence because when this man was disturbed, everyone else got uncomfortable too, all Jerusalem with him. And he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law. He asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen, it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So who were these magi in the Christmas story? If you listen to the Christmas carols, you will be told that there were three of them and they were kings. But the Bible actually doesn't tell us either one of those things. You have to go pretty deep in scripture and into history, ancient world history, to get a sense of who these individuals were. Magi first appear as a group about 700 years before the birth of Christ. And they seem to be a class or a tribe within the Mede and Persian Empire. And they were considered to be a priestly tribe. They were referred to as wise men because of their intense education and, and very advanced education. So they studied things like math, science, agriculture, history, and they also studied uh, supernatural and spiritual things. In fact, it is believed that the entire law of the Medes and the Persians was built on the wisdom that came from this tribe or this class of priests in their culture. And in fact, history records that no one was ever uh, made king of Persia unless two things occurred. First of all, the individual who was supposed to be king had to basically be trained in all of the wisdom of these magi and pass those examinations. And then they were the ones who actually placed the crown on the head of the new king. So now you can understand why Herod would be disturbed or troubled at their coming. They were king makers. That's what they did. Now, one of the most prominent men in the Old Testament, his name was Daniel, and he is unique because he excels in two areas that usually you don't see in the same person. One is he was an absolutely brilliant intellect, but he was also spiritually sensitive, and he exercised great influence during his lifetime. When he was a young man, he was actually abducted from Israel and taken captive and put into service in Babylon. And at that place, that is where he became head of the wise men or head of the magi. And the reason that occurred was because there had been a dream that the king had and no one 
knew what the dream was. The king couldn't remember it, and he required the wise men to interpret the dream, and they said, well, what's the dream? And he said, uh, you tell me. And they said, that's never been done. And so the king said, then all of you will die. And uh, so uh, Daniel asked for a slight delay, and he went in and prayed, and God showed him what the dream was and its interpretation. And he said that he would be happy to give that to the king if he was willing to spare the life of the Magi. So the Magi actually held Daniel in very high regard. That also explains why they may have come in contact with some ancient prophecies about the Messiah. In Numbers, the 24th chapter, it tells us that there would be a star that would rise that would signify the birth of the child who would be king over Israel. And uh, that Actually, that prophecy is interesting. It was given by the guy, uh, a guy whose name was Balaam, who has kind of a mixed record. Sometimes he got it right, and sometimes he was a real uh, problem. And, uh, but he did give that prophecy. And so when they saw this unusual appearance in the heavens, they thought, maybe this is what that was referring to. And they put whatever pieces of the puzzle they had together, and even though they weren't certain, they did want to investigate for themselves. So they went to find out if this Christ child existed. Now, they brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is like cash, frankincense is like scented candles, and myrrh is like cologne or perfume, which means we haven't improved on our gift giving in over 2,000 years. <laughs> Basically get the same stuff. Right? So. What I'd like to talk to you about today is this concept of guidance, and here's what I want you to see. Guidance is complicated. Guidance is complicated. We think that guidance is a lot like the GPS system we use on our phone or in our car to get to a location of our choosing. But as it turns out, guidance with God is quite different because God does not provide guidance to get us where we want to go. God provides guidance to get us where he wants us to go, and that looks quite a bit different. So let's just uh, think about this for a minute. Let's suppose that there were still stars that showed up that, that gave some guidance to you. I mean, wouldn't it be cool if a star would just appear over the college that you're supposed to choose? That'd be, wouldn't that be great? I mean, that would take a lot of stress out of the equation, except that the star wouldn't tell you what major to take. The star wouldn't tell you what classes to enroll in. The star wouldn't tell you what professors to connect with. The star wouldn't tell you what extracurricular activities you should be participating in. Guidance is complicated. Or how about a star that shows over the place where you're supposed to work? That'd be nice. But that star wouldn't tell you what, a, what position to apply for or what a salary to negotiate or what retirement plan to invest in, or even how long you're supposed to be there. How about a star that shines over the city you're supposed to live in? Well, that'd be nice, but that doesn't tell you what neighborhood, or what house, or how much to pay for, or how to decorate it. How about this? A star that shows up over the person you're supposed to marry. That would take a lot of the guesswork out, wouldn't it? Are you sure? Because that star wouldn't tell you when to marry or how to propose. A lot of you don't know this, but I almost proposed by accident. It's true. T to Susan. But it was so early in the relationship that if I'd actually asked that question then, I might still be a bachelor today. And that's how that would have gone. So you don't know when to propose. You don't know how many children to have. You don't know what day to get married on. It doesn't teach you how to resolve conflict. You see, guidance is complicated. Being in the right place is only part of the challenge in figuring out what it is we're supposed to do. So where are we supposed to be? How long are we supposed to be there? Who are we supposed to meet there? What are we supposed to do there? Guidance is complicated. So what I want you to see is that when we're working through this, there's a couple things that are benefits to us when we're in a state of not knowing and uncertainty. And then there's a couple of ways that we can discern the guidance of God a little more clearly. And the first thing about uncertainty or a confusing season is this. You can learn a lot about yourself in a confusing season. We usually tend to see the downside of a confusing season. And uh, we feel uncertain, we feel insecure, uh, we feel confused, and all of those feelings are not positive feelings. They, they make us anxious. 
And here's what I want you to see. This is a great season to start asking yourselves some soul-searching questions. Here's the problem. Most of us don't ask questions. Most of us just make assumptions. And our self-talk can be incredibly negative when we don't know what to do. Oh, you're so stupid. Why did you ever choose that? You're such an idiot. We, just, we fill our hearts and our minds with accusations against us instead of asking questions that could be very helpful. And here's what you need to know. You are not a statue carved in marble that will not change over history. You are flesh and blood, your body, soul, and spirit. And there can be a lot of transformation that occurs in you over the course of your lifetime. You are not a finished product. You are not yet the masterpiece that God intends for you to be. And so these times and seasons of uncertainty can be great opportunities to just ask some really key questions about ourselves and how we're handling things. And the second thing, a benefit of this uncertain season is you can experience community. Uh, when you don't know where to go or how to get there, it's just natural to ask someone for help. But here's what you need to know about this. It is helpful to build community before you get to the place of uncertainty. Because once you are in uncertainty and you're just asking strangers for help, you don't know what their capacities or their competencies are. You don't know how they can speak into your life or if they're giving you good counsel or if they're properly motivated or if they want the best for you. So it's always good, please understand me, it's always good to take those steps to build community into your life so that when seasons come and it's time to lean on some folks, you have a sense of who they are and what they think about you. It's really, really helpful. So you can experience community. Now, if you want God's guidance, here's a couple of things that will help. And the first is this, dare to trust God's word. Even though... Uh, this journey had started as a result of a prophecy for the Magi. They saw a star, and they followed that star, but there came a point at which they needed more information than just the appearance of a star could give them. And so they went to Jerusalem. They came in contact with chief priests who referred to Scripture, and they were given a location of a town. Now, here's what I want you to see about this. Uh, there are certainly some very complicated theological constructs in Scripture. These are things that people have discussed and even argued about for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. For example, uh, we know that the Scripture teaches the concept of the Trinity, that God is three and God is one. There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they are God. There's Heavenly Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and someone says, oh, you believe in three gods. No, we believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And people just go, how do you understand that? And the answer is, we really struggle to understand, it, and it's hard to communicate. Or how about this? The tension between the sovereignty of God and the free will of people. Christians have been arguing about this forever because what is God's part and what is our part? And people have a tendency to veer one side or the other on their conversations related to that. And here's what happens. Sometimes we get so attracted to the complicated things that we ignore the simple things. And here's what I want you to know. Please, pursue those complicated things. God does some great work when we're trying to learn and better understand those things. But don't avoid or ignore the simple things. Simple things like what? How about this? The Bible says to tell the truth. One of the top com ten commands, do not lie. Uh, Paul would write to the church in the New Testament, and he would say, speak the truth in love. So do you trust that that is actually the best thing to do when you feel like you have a lot to lose? Do we dare to trust God's word? Or do we go, well, I think most of the time it's good to tell the truth, but in this case, it's probably better that I don't. The Bible says do not steal. Do you trust that that is the best option when you think no one will know if you take something that doesn't belong to you or maybe even someone else will get blamed? It's amazing how many people will exercise that option. The Bible says to be alert and to be sober. Do you trust the wisdom of Scripture when others around you are numbing their senses with mind-altering substances? We live in a numbed culture. We are not alert. 
A lot of our culture can be explained as a drunken stupor. And how does this happen? It's not an accident. So the Bible says we need to have our wits about us. We need to be clear thinking. Uh, the Bible says don't sin in your anger. Do you trust the guidance of God's word when your emotions are about to erupt? Uh, generosity. Do you trust God's ability to provide for you so that you're willing to help someone else? And this is, it occurred to me, there's a reason why we doubt God's ability to provide for us. And that's because God didn't seem to provide for the person that we need to help now. So how did they get in that shape? Why didn't God provide for them? So I'd just like you to rethink the equation. You are the way God is providing for them. And just as surely as he will use you to provide for them, if you're ever in a situation, he will use others to provide for you. See? These are very simple, simple things, and yet we struggle with them. Because when the tension is on or the temptation is there, we want to exercise another option. Learn to dare to trust God's word. It's what it says in Psalm 119, right? Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. So we want to learn to dare to trust God's word, and we need to learn to discern God's voice in our lives. Uh, this is one of the main goals, actually, of studying Scripture. Some people think the study of Scripture is just to learn the history of God's interaction with his people or uh, certain commands or principles, and all of that is valid and valuable, but it's not limited to that. Part of the reason we study Scripture is so that we can learn to discern God's voice. Now, here's what you should know. Most of us will never, ever hear God speak in an audible voice. Most of us will never have the night sky flash with light as angels appear and give us inside information. Most of us will not have angels blowing trumpets in our rooms in the middle of the night. How many are actually relieved about that? That could be a little unsettling. So how does God actually get information to us? And the answer is, is that God doesn't He's not limited to sight or sound in order to insert a thought into your mind. God can do that. Now, here's the question. Well, how do I know which thought is my thought, and how do I know which thought is God's thought? And we can get hung up on this. So let's, let's take a test. I'm going to give you some thoughts, and you can tell me whether it's God or whether it's self. All right? I want to slap that person. <laughs> Do you think that's God or self? Yeah, I think so too. All right? I, I think so too. I want to give them a piece of my mind. Yeah. You see, it's not really as hard to tell as you think. Now, here's the thing. Let's suppose a thought comes into your mind, I think I would like to help that person. And then you go, well, is that God or is that me? And I'll tell you what I do about that, because sometimes I can't tell. So I'll help them anyway. And you know why? Because maybe God is up in heaven and, go, and goes like this. Look at that. He came up with one on his own. <laughs> <laughs> There's hope for this boy after all. How about that? You know? Just, we get so paralyzed and, and unable to take some steps. Be a student of Scripture. Not just because you're trying to memorize facts for a test that you may have to take someday. Be a student of Scripture because you get a sense of how God talks to people. And you get a sense for the kinds of things that he says. And then when a prompting or an action thought comes to your heart or to your mind, you have something to refer it to. It just gives you some insight as to whether this is to be trusted or not. This is what it says in Proverbs, the third chapter. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. If you want God's direction in your life, we have to learn to discern his voice and then we have to have the courage to follow through on those steps. Why does God do this? Why doesn't he just give us very clear directions? Kind of like some of the toys that some of us will be assembling, getting ready for the Christmas season, which, by the way, some of those instructions leave a lot to be desired. And here's what you should know. 
is that there are some things God can't impart to us just with instructions. You have something to offer God. And if all you had was just a set of instructions, you might not ever do it. God's will will not override your will. You didn't see God drag me up here on the stage, twist my arm behind my back to make me talk to you today. That's not how God works. He gives opportunities, and he gives promptings, and he gives a sense of direction. And then we have to ask ourselves, am I willing to take a step? God won't become an escape for your responsibility. God doesn't like it much when people use the church to hide out from other things they're supposed to be taking care of. And if all we had was a list of instructions, we might misuse that. And here's the goal about God's guidance. It's not so that you can feel spiritually superior to other people around you. God has things that he wants you to experience. The reason he gives us guidance is because there are things he wants us to experience for ourselves. The wise men could have stayed home. The Magi just could have waited for news to come. Indeed, there was a report of a king that was born in Israel. And they could go, yep, that was the prophecy. And they said there would be a star. We saw the star and we got the report. That was true. And for some people, that's all they ever know about their faith. But God guides us so that we don't just hear the reports of what's true, but we get to experience it for ourselves. God has areas in in your life that he would like you to grow and develop in. And there are some things you just don't learn by reading instructions. And God has people that he hopes you'll develop relationships with so that his river of grace that has flown in your life will flow through your life and make a difference in their life. That's why God guides us the way he does. Now, there are going to be moments in your life when you feel like your path is closed or you've lost your way, and that can be a highly anxious time or frustrating time. I have never one time come across a detour sign and said to myself, I am so glad that detour sign is there. Not one time. I'm always annoyed every single time. Frustration is the only emotion I experience right then. Why? Because I'm not sure where they're going to take me, and I don't know how long it's going to take, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay on schedule. And I hate detour signs. But... The wise men had a detour that took them to Jerusalem, which exposed them to Scripture on the way to Bethlehem. And the wise men had a detour on the way home that probably spared their lives. Please understand this. Extra steps might not be the worst thing in our lives. God is far more concerned in effectiveness than efficiency. And he is committed to doing his work in us no matter how long it takes. So don't miss out on that. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, If you're in a season where you feel a little disoriented or uncertain, um, I want you right now to rethink this season in your life, and I want you to see it as a gift that the only reason this season has come to you is because something you assumed was true has been challenged. And you're either going to be able to verify that or you're going to see that ongoing pursuit in that direction is not most beneficial to you. What if the detours in our lives weren't accidents? What if they were part of God's intervention? What if God reroutes our lives frequently so that we talk to certain people, access certain information, and experience certain things because you really do have some amazing things to offer, things that are worth far more than gold or frankincense or myrrh? Maybe just because you can't see the next step doesn't mean there's not one. And if I could give you any word of confidence today, there is no step that you will take that can take you away from God. 
and his capacity to get us back on track is stunning. It's breathtaking. You can trust that. So, Father, I ask you would help us today. We become anxious and we become angry when it feels like we don't know what's next or things are not working out the way we planned. Would you help us to see that even in what looks like detours to us, you are at work to get us exactly where we are supposed to be, exactly with who we're supposed to be there with, at exactly the right time, because you have an amazing thing to release in our lives and through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together this morning.